Today on Pop Culture Catechism, we are talking about Paramore. Welcome to Pop Culture Catechism, conversations about music, movies, and the longings of the human heart. Let's get started. Is hope real? Is it even really possible to achieve your childhood dreams? What about when it seems like my dreams and my hopes have crumbled? Can I start again? Is it even worth it to try to start again? How do I dream and how do I hope and how do I love in a dark and painful world? How did we get here when I used to know you so well? Now, you might be thinking, Mike, look, I am an OG pod, pop catch. I am an OG pop culture catechism listener. And I remember you already did a Paramore episode. It was episode number six. You had Benjamin Jude on and you talked about Paramore's riot. It was a great episode. You were all emo and everything. And you would be right. But in the early days, I thought I was going to be doing more like single album reviews. And I've changed things a bit since then. Plus, they have like four other really good albums Paramore does. And plus, they are touring and recording a new album. They have a new single coming out and for the first time in five years. And so they're also probably like my favorite band of the 21st century. And I'm the show host. So I get to do what I want. So get over it because we're going to talk about Paramore again. Lastly, because I have the opportunity today to talk with two excellent fans of Paramore, but also excellent musicians and recording artists, Emma and David Cruz. So that's who we're going to be talking to today. They, we're going to hear them all the way from Australia. If you don't know who I am, I am Mike Tenney, Catholic speaker and worship leader from Washington, D.C. I spent over a decade teaching Catholic high school theology and also trying to make it big as a rock star. And now I am blessed to speak and lead music for thousands of people each year at events all over the place and through this show, Pop Culture Catechism. This is Pop Culture Catechism, the gospel according to pop music and movies, where we look for God's love in the media that you're plugged into so that then when we unplug and we put down our phones and our tablets, whatever, we can actually go out in the world and live the gospel and know God's love better. So my goal for us by the end of this episode, not only will you have a deeper appreciation for the music and the message of Paramore, but you'll also have some practical, tangible ideas for how to go out in the world and try to live God's love and know God's love better. Special thank you to our patrons who make this show possible through popculturecatechism.com. Without further ado, I want to welcome to the show, Emma Cruz and David Cruz. Welcome, guys. Hey. Hey, Mike. Hey. Tell us about yourselves. Well, um, we've been married for about three and a half months. We got married Woo. here in Brisbane. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we, uh, we met uh, in 2020 through a mutual friend. Emma was recording a song and um, she asked a friend of hers in Minnesota, who is a family friend of mine, um, to play cello for her song. And, and her friend in Minnesota asked if I would record her playing. And uh, so I, I heard Emma's music for the first time. And I thought, oh, I would love to talk to this girl about this idea I have of, of starting a Catholic record label. And um, we talked about, we, we finally scheduled a video call and we talked about the record label for about five minutes in a two hour call. <laughs> and uh, the, rest, the rest is history. But um, we were, we were stuck in uh, uh, long distance uh, because in Australia, they weren't letting anybody in and weren't letting anybody out. So I was in Minnesota and she was in Australia for 13 months before we wow. met in person last year. And uh, yeah, music is a big part of our lives. Our faith is a huge part of our lives. We work for the Archdiocese of Brisbane and uh, we got nice. all kinds of stuff going on. Cool. Well, tell us about this uh Catholic record label? I guess we, um, well, I don't know. I know a lot of people aren't like this, but I, I've always had a bit of a um, bee in my bonnet about worship music and Christian music. Like I think mm -hmm. overall it's good and it, it has its place, but I've always sort of felt like it's a bit simple or it's, it's not intricate enough or mainly that it could yeah. be so much more. Um, so like I've written music for, for a number of years um, and it, it's not worship music. It's more just music about my own relationship with God. Um, and I guess in talking to David and, and hearing him, hearing his music, which is sort of, yeah, just thinking and dreaming about, yeah, what music could be like when it's not um, restricted to just worship music. Um, so yeah, we have a big heart for finding other Catholic musicians and, 
and building them up and helping them, you know, like helping them mm. write, helping them record, produce, helping them market themselves. Um, and then when they are kind of ready to go, yeah, just want everyone to hear it. Like I want everyone to hear this is what it can be, you know? So, and the hope mm -hmm. is that it will just mm -hmm. inspire more artists to keep going. And a big part of our record label, it's sort of seems, seems like our side project, but we've started doing this Bible study for artists in our home for oh, a couple cool. of weeks. And yeah, the discussions are just so fruitful and it's just so good when you get a bunch of creative people in the room, their minds start working and yeah. Now that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I'm, I'm excited to, to hear uh, more of your guys' stuff. Now, Emma, I've heard some of your music, David, I don't think I've heard uh, your music yet, but Emma, you are in a band. I don't know if you still are uh, heaps good friends. Yeah. Right? Yep. Yeah. It's really cool. It's kind of, kind of a little bit like Mr. Wives, a little bit like maybe churches, Paramore a little bit, some of their newer stuff, <laughs> um, but it's really cool. So and anyway, listeners, if you're, if you're into some uh, good music, I would, I highly recommend uh, heaps good friends. Very, very good stuff. So, um, all right. Well, anything else you need to tell us about before we get into Paramore? Um, I think the other thing with the, with the record label, the only thing I can think of is that there's been like, a. have I've noticed, I, I spent some time in seminary and, um, I always noticed that artists, especially like, um, well, while in seminary, it was always seminarians that were artists. There was always an, there was always an aspect that they kind of struggled a bit with their faith. There was there was things that that they had to deal with in their interior life that was different than um, everybody else, you know. And it was almost it's almost like the the more creative you are, you have you have a different kind of spirituality that's necessary in order for spiritual health. And um, part of the idea with the record label as well uh, for me is I've seen a lot of musicians, a lot of Catholic musicians, leave the the church essentially you know, or go through some kind of big upheaval of their faith. And it just breaks yeah. my heart because I can, I can, I can relate to it. And I can, and I remember a time where, where I felt like music, uh, my, my music career and my music and my creativity was, was really like, um, not, it didn't, couldn't live well with my faith and, um, yeah, serving them in that way, I think is really, really important. A Bible study for artists is one yeah. way of getting that started, but we're hoping to do more as well. Yeah, I, I highly agree as an as an artist myself. I, I associate so much with much with what both of you said, Emma, when you were talking about like being a songwriter, but like not really being into worship music. Like I love worship music, I love playing worship music, I need it all the time, but I like I'm terrible at writing it. I feel like I've never been able to write it because it's like very simple. I don't know if that's, yeah. Anyway. And then David, what you were talking about, just like the, the heart of the artist that like wants to push boundaries. It wants to ask questions. I remember hearing a, a interview with Matt Marr one time and he said, you know, sometimes these Christian artists, we get put on a pedestal, like we're a pastor or we're a saint. And he's like, really, I think if you're an artist, people should like not trust you because you're <laughs> processing things out loud in public and you, you're constantly publicly in process. And so that's, yeah. that's like the role of the artist. That's kind of the role of the prophet. So mm -hmm. I, I definitely um, associate with that a lot of what you just said. All right. Well, let's talk about Paramore. Paramore, if you don't know, they are an American rock band from Franklin, Tennessee, formed in 2004. They have had one, two, three, four, five albums. Their sixth album is coming out. They had All, you, all We Know Is Falling in 2005, Riot in 2007. We did an episode on that. Uh, we're not going to talk about that album today because we've already covered all that music. So if you're interested in the Riot album, go back to episode six. And uh, we, we did the whole thing in a deep dive. Uh, Brand New Eyes in 2009, their self-titled Paramore, which I think is uh, probably their most successful. That's where some of their big hits came from that, that you've probably heard. Uh, After Laughter in 2017, which I think we're going to focus not exclusively on, but uh, a lot on today because it's it's awesome. <laughs> and then an unnamed sixth album, which they have been teasing, like they, they just announced the first signal of it, a single for it today, uh, the day of this recording. So maybe by the time this episode comes out, we might have a few singles. We might have an album. Um, and then patrons, if you're a patron of the show, uh, I will do a, when that album comes out, I will do a review of that whole album and that will be just for patrons. So if you're interested in that, go to popculturecatechism.com. You can become a patron. So first thing I want to talk about before we get into themes of some of the songs, I just want to talk about artistically, what do you guys love? about Paramore? What do they, what do they do really well? Oh man. Um, and again, I am sort of just speaking exclusively on for the after laughter album. Cause I, I haven't really ventured into any of the other stuff, but mostly because I'm still so enthralled by after laughter. 
when I first hear Paramore, I just think of like colors. Like I think it's just so colorful, like the way they use guitars and yeah, and and the bass and I don't know. It's just a big color mess of goodness. I don't know. What would you say? <laughs> yeah, I just think they're such a great combination of like musical prowess, good songwriting, and like um, like a like unity. You know, like that's an that's yeah. that's always an element, right? As a as a band and as a songwriter, is like, yeah, you might have a great bass player, you might have a great guitar player, you might have a great drummer, and you might have a great singer, but they don't they don't mesh. And and like sometimes that's okay, you know, and they kind of do their own thing, and like at, they take turns kind of being featured in the band. But like Paramore, it's like they're all awesome, and they're like they're just one solid unit. Like I, I they're yeah. they're their music is just so incredibly detailed too. Mm. Like they just had to, you know, the, the synchronized fills with the bass licks and like um, the synchronized bass licks with the guitar licks. And then like Haley Williams and her vocal delivery. I, I, I love how um, she's just, I mean, she's unreal. And, and her ability yeah. to make a, a great melody um, out of really like, um, strong lyrics, I would say, but also having it very, very rhythmic. Like she has an unusually rhythmic vocal delivery, I would say. And I think her ability to do that kind of allows her to be able to, to do more with her, with her lyrics. Cause she can fit more syllables in and she can like, you know, she can, she can just pull off more than the average singer. So she can kind of get away with like <laughs> rhymes that don't quite rhyme, but they sound cool because she's doing it well, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. And, yeah, I don't know. There's a lot to say there. Not to mention just the production. The production of After Laughter, mm -hmm. I think, is brilliant. It's like this 80s yeah, kind of their uh, their producer, um, it's Justin Metal Johnson, I think is his name. He did he did a bunch of stuff for Nine Inch Nails and then he's done their last two albums. But and he play, he plays bass all over the album too, and he's just oh, really? he's ridiculous. He's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um but Haley's voice, good grief. I once heard it described as Kelly Clarkson's wildest dreams. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I, I love the voice, uh, everything you guys said, and especially on, on After Laughter, the way the, like I was, my wife and I both love that album. And when uh, the, when we started the episode with, with you guys playing a little bit of uh, Rose Colored Boy. And by the way, if you like that little clip that you got at the beginning, we're going to put the whole thing at the end of this show. So wait till the end and you can see the whole performance. Thank you guys for sending that to us, by the way. But after I you guys sent it to us ahead of time and I sent it to my wife and she's like, I need to go figure out how to play that. So like she and I went downstairs to our music room, the piano's right behind me. And she was like figuring out, I was figuring it out. And it's like the, the chords and the riff, you wouldn't think they like necessarily make sense together, but then you play them together and they, and, and they work. So it's, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I absolutely agree with what you said about the colors and how they kind of, they come together and they're very, very cohesive. It's like, they're a bunch, they're a bunch of music nerds, you know, oh, <laughs> you know, in a yeah. punk indie band. Juilliard, so, Juilliard um, dropouts. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've always loved their riffs. The you know they, they've switched guitarists a few times. Uh, Taylor's been with them for a while, but uh, before that, but they had they had Josh. But both of them are really excellent at riffs. My guitar style playing is very much like that. Like I'm not like a John Mayer can solo all over the place sort of guy, but I love a good riff. And so these guys, uh, you know, I, I love learning all their stuff. Um, and their drum, Zach Farrow is one of my favorite drummers. Oh. Of he's probably my favorite pop punk like emo st style uh, drummer, even more than like Travis Barker. I just think he's, he can make stuff that's like super heavy and makes you want to mosh or he can do stuff that is, you know, more fun. And he, he's yeah. just got such a palette with, with the drums. So yeah, all that. And the lyrics, which we will get into more. Um, anything else artistically you want to talk about before we dive into some songs? I just think Haley's really good at writing bri like bridges or middle eights for songs. Mm. I feel like in a lot of songs these days, when it comes to the middle eight slash bridge, it just kind of is a bit like, oh yeah, like that was okay. I guess it took me away from the chorus and it comes back to the chorus, mm -hmm. which I'm excited about, but I feel that I really like the way she writes a bridge. It's, yeah, yeah it could be another chorus yeah. in a sense. Yeah, like totally. it's just yep. top quality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally, totally agree. They, you know, they, they say Taylor Swift is like the queen of bridge writing, but I would put Haley like, <laughs> so yeah. All right, very good. So let's get into some of the themes. Uh, probably the first theme that I want to talk about, let's, let's go into to After Laughter. Um, 
actually, before we get there, because I feel, I feel like if you've traveled with Paramore from the beginning, which I have, I got to know them off their first album in like 2005. There was a kid in my youth group with pink hair who like gave me a mix CD and Paramore was all over it. I was like, who is this? And so I've been following them ever since. And it was interesting because they started off as a very hopeful emo band like when in the same age as like my chemical romance and you know they're they're everyone's sad everyone's mad at themselves everyone hates themselves and they have very very hopeful lyrics and then as the albums go on there starts to be this darkness that creeps in but it's funny the music gets like happier sounding but the lyrics get like way sadder (laughs) so we're gonna we're gonna kind of follow that arc as we go so um and and that's okay if you guys aren't as familiar with the early stuff because your 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 stand here has has the knowledge (laughs) so uh i want to talk about some some of their earlier stuff which has kind of this idea of there's this dream that i have there's this innocence i have and i feel like i'm losing it and i'm thinking of uh songs like uh brick by boring brick where there's this line where it says um keep your feet on the ground with when your head's in the clouds so kind of this idea of yes you should dream but you got to keep your feet rooted and you can't be just dreaming all the time because the world will come crashing down around you and there, there's a lot of other songs like this i think ignorance off their ne- off uh, the next album or off that same album was the same way um and then off the self-titled probably their most famous song um Ain't it fun living in the real world? Ain't it good being all alone? Ain't it good to be on your own? Ain't it fun you can't count on no one? Ain't it good to be on your own? Ain't it fun you can't count on no one? Ain't it fun? Living in the real world. So that song, if you've heard a Paramore song, you've probably heard that one. But it's kind of like talking to herself about like, hey, you wanted to be an adult. You wanted to be a grow up. You wanted to live in the real world. And uh, ain't it fun? Like, there's, uh, there's no one to blame your problems on. Yeah, like, right. The buck kind of stops with you. So I wondered if we, we could talk about this because it's so prevalent in their music. How do you... <laughs> How do you grow up without letting it crush your soul? <laughs> mm. Yeah. I feel like, especially you guys, you, I mean, we're all musicians here, right? Probably all of us had this dream of like being super famous and like winning Grammys at some point. I know I did. I don't know if you guys did. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> I think I, I find it interesting with, with Paramore in particular, like that, that like, kind of X axis that you described earlier where their music has gotten sort of lighter, but their lyrics mm-hmm. have gotten a little darker, you know, to me, there's this, there's this process of maturity that happens where you're dealing with the reality of being an adult. You're dealing with the reality of the world um, kind of sucks in a lot of ways and it's really pretty messed up and you just don't see it when you're in middle school you know, and you're getting into music and everything is glorious. You know, you haven't had the the wounds of life yet. And, um, but then as you come, as you, as you kind of cross the threshold into adulthood, it's almost at its worst because you have the sensitivity of, of youth, but you have the reality of adulthood, you know? And I think, um, I don't know. I find that, I find that after laughter is a good sort of like artistic depiction of like, uh, almost getting used to it. Because I really think that in a lot of ways as an artist, you, you, don't, you don't really get over it. You don't really get over the heartbreak of the world. It, you just get used to it, you know? Like you just, you just soak it in and, and, it, and it, you accept it, you know? And eventually it becomes, okay, but I'm operating uh, within this reality. I'm operating within this broken world. And it's, it's not any better, but I'm getting, I'm getting more used to it. I'm learning how to function within it. And I find that after laughter is so interesting because the, yeah, the music and the feel of it is more fun. You know, it's lighter. The colors aren't as black, even like the music videos, like they, their color scheme from riot, right. Is oh, just yeah. black, white, and like kind of probably some red or some, you know, Haley's yeah. hair, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, or whatever color it is at the time. Like, you know, and then they go into after laughter and the color scheme is like this pastel eighties kind of blue you know, and, and, uh, and gray and all kinds of, you know, crazy things and the music videos. 
And um, it still has that element of, of darkness and, and um, you know, some, some hopelessness. But even the way, even where it's placed kind of in their career, you know, they're in their 30s. You know, it's almost kind of like they're getting used to it and, and they're kind of buckling down. Like there's an element of like, yeah, things still suck, but, but it's, it's getting to be okay. And, and we're starting to, starting to go from black to blue, you know, and I'm curious to see what this next album will be, you know, and, and uh, kind of where they'll go from here. Cause you know, probably a lot of it depends on where they're at kind of in their lives, where Haley Williams is at in her life and, and whatnot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> I'm very curious to see, see uh, what this album holds. Cause la yeah. Like after you, like you said, after laughter is very, um, some places depressing, not the whole way through, but there, there's definitely like seeds of hope, oh. but uh, there's, there's definitely places that get you down. So, yeah. So do you, did you guys as artists, do you feel like you, or maybe just in life, do you feel like you ever had a moment where you were like of like disillusionment where you're like, huh, I guess what I thought as a child I guess that's not really how it is. And, uh, like, do you have any moments like that? Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, there was definitely, I, I had a bit of a unique situation. I, I was full on music career, full on just, I had a, I owned a small recording studio and like, um, was just doing everything I could possibly do to further my music career and uh, doing a bunch of shows kind of around the Midwest. And um, I was, I was 19 and like, I had, I had come kind of from a broken, um, you know, my high school years, my home life was not great. And, uh, and so I had gotten into sort of the music industry lifestyle. And um, I just went through a huge conversion when I was 20 and uh, it, it mm. came from a bit of a rock bottom. And I ended up joining the seminary like two years later. And what happened really with my, with my music career and like the reality of growing up was that um, it was the, it was the reality of being in seminary and committing myself to um, the life that I, that I was planning on, on doing, which was the, the Catholic priesthood, you know? And so I, I pretty much, I remember talking to my Bishop um, and just saying, I think I need to do like a music fast, like just a couple of years off. Like I just need to stop doing music projects because I'm obsessive about it. I just, everything, if I, if I even start writing a song, I'm like, oh, I need to make an album and I'm going to write out the production notes right now. And I'm going to start writing up, you know, string parts or whatever. And like, it was just everything. And it, and it would just completely derail me from what I was actually supposed to be doing with my time. And, and I did like a two year um, kind of fast. And, and my bishop was very wise. He said, um, if the Lord wants you to do music, he'll give it back to you when the time is right. And he was totally right. And it was my fourth year in seminary. And uh, somebody asked me if I'd put together a band for the 125th anniversary of the Diocese of Winona, Rochester in Minnesota. And uh, the, the performance was in the, the biggest like venue in my hometown. And um, yeah, it was in my hometown, which I thought was, you know, symbolic. And it just felt like, yeah, I'm, I'm actually ready to do this again. Um, so I experienced kind of, it was, it was actually, it wasn't too bad. It was, it was hard that purge. Um, but I felt pretty lucky in that, um, yeah, uh, sort of letting go of a music career was kind of like the Abraham and Isaac kind of situation. Like, as long as I'm willing to let it go, I'm, I'm given the freedom to have it. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm given the gift of <laughs> music. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. That must've been really easy to just let go of music. <laughs> <laughs> it was very, very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Well, and then like, when you get back to it, like, do you even have calluses on your finger to play guitar anymore? <laughs> yeah, I still, I still played quite a bit, but it just went completely <laughs> under the radar. It was just my music gotcha. career went from being everything outward to, it was limited to the mm -hmm. confines of my dorm <laughs> in seminary. Gotcha. But, 
but gotcha, yeah. gotcha. I, I, I never got quite as far as seminary. I def, I like broke up with my girlfriend and discerned for a while, went on some retreats, but I never made it quite that far. But I, I, a lot, a lot of your story resonates with, with me of just kind of like young man trying to find his way in the world. God, what do you want from me? I've had this powerful experience. I, I know that you're real and I know you're calling me to something, but you know, music or priesthood or, but there's girls too. And then there's, you know, so a lot of, a lot of what you said, uh, resonates with me. Absolutely. Any, any, uh, thing about disillusionment or lessons from disillusionment you want to chime in with Emma before we move on to depression and despair? <clears throat> I, I, I don't know if I'd have a very interesting answer. Cause I feel like when I was in high school, I was in bands and I lived in this small town and the next biggest city was Adelaide in South Australia. And I always thought I'll move to Adelaide and I'll be in a band. But then when I was 18, similar thing, I had this very powerful conversion experience and just ended up going to Canada to, to be a missionary for two years, which turned into four years. And then, yeah, so I don't know, I, I kind of had the great blessing of finding Jesus and I guess um, still loved music, still wrote a lot of music, but it just started looking different. So, yeah. So you were, were was that with Nat? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So if listeners, if you're not sure what net is, it's the national evangelization team. And basically you can sign up to, to be a missionary for a year or, or more years. Uh, and they, they happen all over the place. I know there, there's some in the U S do, do they have in Australia they too? Do, and you should totally apply. I do. <laughs> 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 all right. Listeners. Yeah. If you're looking for something to do to, to, um, you know, want to, want to be a missionary for a year or longer, definitely check out the national evangelization team. We, we've, we've had a few net alumni on this show as guests. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're a fan. I, I did a, a similar thing, but it was, um, it was a cap core caption Franciscan volunteer Corps, And we worked at like a youth center and ran retreats, like basically out of the youth center. So, Ooh. um, so if, if you grew up in the, in the nineties and in two thousands, you might remember MTV had these two shows road rules. And then, um, what was the other one they were, where they all lived in a house together. It was like house party or something and road rules. They were on the road together and house party was. And so uh, we actually met up with one of the net teams that came through town and we all said, well, you guys are like road rules. You're out on the road. <laughs> we're like the house party. <laughs> we, we stay in the same place, but it's a very similar sort of thing. I only did it for one year though four years that's intense as a missionary um well i did it for two years and then four years after that i worked on staff so it's a little different i got mm -hmm. paid um but i was still yeah a part of net yeah still i mean that's 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 intense <laughs> so kudos Super cool. All right. Well, let's get into, <laughs> we, so we talked about losing the disillusion of, uh, of our innocence. Uh, so what if that takes you down into hard times, which is one of the, the big uh, songs off of after laughter, um, and, uh, other songs on there, like, uh, told you, sh told you so. And, uh, my wife's favorite song, uh, fake happy. <laughs> yeah. Nice. So, mm. uh, I, I think if I had to pick just one off of this album to talk about, because it, it does kind of center around the, a lot of the same theme of kind of going through this depression, depression and despair. Uh, I want to talk about fake happy. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, the lyrics. I'm going to read a little bit of them here. It says, I love making you believe that what you get is what you see, but I'm so fake happy. I feel so fake happy. And I bet everybody here is just as insincere we're all so fake happy and I know fake happy. Um, so let's, let's, let's talk about this a little bit. Um, I mean, do you, do you think she's right? Do you think that we're all fake happy and we're all just faking it? <laughs> <laughs> I think I get what she means, especially I feel like in Christian circles, sometimes like, um, you know, you hear a lot of things like choose joy and, <laughs> um, Obviously, there is this real joy because Jesus died for us and rose again. Um, but it's 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 not something you can just because we're human, like we feel, you know, and because we're musicians, we feel on a deeper level, <laughs> and it's hard sometimes to yeah put on that fake smile. And I think sometimes even when I'm in Christian circles, like just the sort of small talk when you're going between people and everyone's happy, you know, and you're just like far out, like. Um, there's, tell me something more interesting. Like what's the hardest thing that happened to you in the last month? Like, cause that's more mm -hmm. real than I'm good, you know? <laughs> so yeah, yeah I sure. think there's definitely elements to it, but, but at the same time, I wonder what culture would be like if when you ask someone how they were, like they just went there. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
one hundred percent agree. Yeah, and I, I feel like on on this show, some, sometimes uh, my friends are like, "I can't believe you shared that on a podcast, like in front of the whole internet." Because I've I've shared some pretty personal things on here, and sometimes sometimes my wife will be like, "Okay, this doesn't what we're talking about right now. This does not get on the podcast." I'm like, I know, I know, <laughs> because one, I, I totally see what you're saying, like that that whole choose joy thing. Again, not that we're not supposed to be joyful, but there definitely can be just like this facade, this mask of everything's fine. And I'm a Christian, especially if you work in ministry. Mm -hmm. I, I worked as a, a youth minister, a campus minister, a high school religion theology teacher. I, I lead worship at my church. Like um, I'm supposed to have my stuff together, right? Because <laughs> people look to me, but what if I don't always have my stuff together? And so that's one of the reasons why I feel like it's important to share those things. And, and St. Paul, you know, he says, you know, as Christians, we boast of our weakness, right? And so that we're supposed to lean on each other and bear each other's burdens and, and help each other through these things. And also there can kind of be this like fake perfectionism, you know what I mean? Mm. Like, you know, oh, I've got, I've got everything going on and that, that really com comes back to pride. So i you know, I, I agree. I, I, what you said, you know, it would be a strange world if you were walking past someone on the street and you're like, Hey, how you doing? And they were like, terrible. Th you know, <laughs> my marriage is breaking up or whatever is going on. Like that, that would be a weird world. Um, and it does, I think it takes some trust and a little, a little bit of closeness to, to get to that point. So yeah. I'm, I'm not sure we, we should go there, but <laughs> I think we could also use a little bit more, more honesty and a little less of a fake happy mm. one here. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. Yeah. I think there is an element of like musicians really value authenticity. I think the, I think the experience of writing music, you know, I mean, you, you write a song and you're being very, very intentional about every moment of the song, you know, and you're trying to convey an interior experience. And it's usually one that is very mixed. You know, sometimes it is joy sometimes, but, but most of the time it's a combination of a lot of different emotions and, and a lot of different experiences and, you're trying to let that out. And I think that experience of writing music and creating music, but then emotionally connecting with the music after it's written and recorded, you know, like, I think it, it, it gives um, a really heightened expectation for authenticity. And I think, I think musicians have a, because of that, I think musicians have a bit of a, a, a strong nose for fake anything, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I think Haley Williams, just partly because of her, like, um, yeah, her life and it seems like her personal life and the way that she integrates uh, those things into her music, but also like the way that her band has been branded and, and her her style and her, her feel has been certainly encouraged um, um, and kind of it's in demand. Um, I think that's probably for her a pretty real thing, like, like, um, yeah, there's, there's just a fake, a fake happiness. And, but I think it also just harkens to the fact that we're all looking for authentic happiness, <laughs> you know, yes. like, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's yeah, and, and a happiness that isn't just, uh, an emotion that is here for now, but gone in, yeah. in minutes, you know, something totally. more lasting and solid, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, sorry, go ahead. Well, yeah, it's just, it's, it's interesting. It's, a uh, um, it's almost like a, a spiritual practice, <laughs> you know, uh, of searching for authentic. I mean, it is a spiritual practice, searching for authentic happiness, searching for authentic joy, you know. Um, but as an artist, um, trying to do that through your art, I think is a really like uh, noble process. You know, I think it's a really noble thing to do as an artist to say, all right, I am actually processing this stuff. In, in our Bible study, actually, there was a girl that said that the other day. She said, we kind of use art as a way of processing our emotions. So it's hard to like judge art as good or bad because a lot of times the artist themselves are just in the process of working through something, you know, and I found that really, really insightful. So one last thing about their songs about depression and despair. Uh, so on Brand New Eyes, there's this one song called Turn It Off. And she says, it, this song, this whole album talks a little bit about her, her losing her faith or questioning her faith a little bit. And there's one part where she says, it's getting harder to believe in anything and just to get lost in all my selfish thoughts. And then the chorus is, the worst part is, before it gets any better, we're heading for a cliff. <laughs> it's like, I'm, I'm going through this stuff and I, I know like, 
before it gets better, it's, it's going to get worse and I just got to go through it. Um, and it says, but in the free fall, I finally realize that I'm better off when I hit the bottom. Like hitting that rock bottom moment sometimes can be a gift. Sometimes it's what you need to realize like, hey, something needs to change. Like, hey, I, I need something higher than myself. I need something beyond myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've, been, I've been listening to that, that song a lot recently and that idea of, you know, I know before it gets any better, we're headed for a cliff, but I, I just kind of got to keep going and be, being faithful and, and, and choosing, you know, as, as much as we don't want to choose joy in a way that's just like, you know, putting on the fake smile, like as David, you were saying, like it is a spiritual practice and whether you do that through creating art or you do that through your prayer or, you know, however you do that. I mean, therapy is great. You know, <laughs> counseling is great. All that stuff is great. Uh, talking with good friends and spiritual mentors. That's how you day by day work through this stuff. And, um, you know, God is able to kind of take the, <laughs> take the manure and grow flowers out of it. You know what yeah. I mean? right. like, take the awful stuff of life and, and bring something beautiful out of it. And I, I've seen it happen in my own life and in friends' lives. And, um, to that when I do face the manure times of life, <laughs> I have, I'm able to look back and remember like, right. Remember when God's brought me through this before, remember when God brought them through that before, like, and just, just kind of keep going, keep going, keep going. So, uh, listeners, if you're going through a time like that, we highly record, you know, want to encourage you keep going, find some people to help you turn to God, turn to some friends, maybe a therapist, maybe you need to go back to confession, um, go before the Eucharist, the sacraments, all of those things are awesome things that can help you. Was there, was there something else you wanted to mention before we move on? Oh, I was just going to say when, um, your example of those lyrics, like when you hit the bottom, it's almost like, um, rock bottom is realizing like, I actually can't, well, I guess, depending on the situation, but at times it can kind of be, I actually can't bring myself out of this and I need God. Mm. And it's almost a relief in a sense, you know, it's just sort of like letting God do it for you. And obviously we need to say yes to God, participate and co-create ourselves with God in a sense. Mm. But yeah, it, it is that sort of, sometimes we can fight so hard to be out of our difficult situation, but if you just accept it, you know, and meditating on the, the cross, like it can, yeah. That was just what I had to say. <laughs> no, I'm so, I'm so glad you said that. I'm so glad you said that. Uh, and that a whole idea that we can unite our suffering to the cross of Christ and we can, we can look to the cross and gain encouragement that like everything we went through, Christ went through and is going through it with us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he gives us hope that what I'm going through isn't meaningless, you know, and that what I'm going through isn't the end. So absolutely. I will, yeah. Thank you so much for saying that. I think that's, that's an encouraging word for me. And I know, I know it will be for other people too. So that's a, excellent transition into hope. So, mm -hmm. uh, first song I want to talk about is, uh, th there's a few songs on, on brand new eyes, uh, looking up and where the, uh, where the lines overlap are both like very hopeful songs. The one I am thinking of off of their self titled titled album is just called last hope. And there's, there's, if you go on YouTube and search for the live version of last hope, it's in Chicago and it, she's got blue hair and she's playing piano and it's, it's like super epic. So if you're looking for <laughs> to go down a, a paramore rabbit hole on YouTube, I, hi I ri highly recommend their live version of last hope. And she's just like, come on Chicago. It's, it's, it's insane. Um, <laughs> But uh, the way that song starts, it says, I don't even know myself at all. I thought it would be better. I, I thought I would be happy, but I'm not. Um, and uh, every day I try to, it talks about e every day I wake up believing that it's going to get better. And then I realize, huh, it's not better today. And, but then the chorus is, but it will happen. I got to let it happen. It's just a spark, but it's enough to keep me holding on. And when it's dark out, um, and anyway, so it's just this beautiful idea that like, even when it's hard, like all I need is this little spark to hold on to. And I think it's, it's absolutely, um, you know, it, it absolutely points us to God. Uh, the one that I was going to ask about off of after laughter was, uh, how do you guys feel about this song? 26, 26, which one is that? Again? That's, that's a slower song, song, is it? Yeah. Um, oh, I'm more familiar with the songs. I might oh, be able sorry. to play a little bit of the. Hold on to hope if you got it. Don't let it go for nobody. They say that dreaming is free, but I wouldn't care what it cost me. Yeah, right. With like the strings and like the whole. 
uh -huh. just a, just acoustic yeah. guitar and strings and yeah. I reckon mm -hmm. what I really appreciate about Haley Williams is in the, those two examples you gave there, there is hope, but like um, in Rose Colored Boy where she says like, I want you to stop insisting that I'm not a lost cause because I've been through that. <laughs> I just friggin' love that because, <laughs> you know, when you're in pain and someone's telling you like, be happy or it'll get better, you're just like, no, like you're not recognizing how crap it is for me right now. And I think that is so important. Like not, not in a despairing way, but just to really pay attention to how crap it feels. <laughs> and I think she's so good at doing that. Um, and yeah, in 26, the song you were just talking about. Um, yeah. Like if, well, if you and, don't have, hope, what, what, it, sorry, go ahead. Like if you don't have hope, then that feeling of like, look at my crap will just, you'll just stay looking at your crap and you'll, you know, despair into oblivion. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and what, what does Jesus say in the Beatitudes? He says, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. And there's part of the mourning, like the, the comfort, the, you can't arrive at the real comfort without having mourned, right? You can't reach real like resolution until you've gone through that process. And that that's, one of the truths of the faith, but it's one of the truths of psychology as well is, you know, you got to process it. You can't just shove it under. You've got to deal with this loss. You've got to deal with this grief and, and sit and experience it. And that's why so many cultures around the world, they have these rituals of mourning mm -hmm. and periods of mourning and, and, and grief. And, uh, they sit with it and people visit the house and grieve with them. And, you know, there's like ritual crying and all these, uh, these sorts of things is it's, it's built into us that we, we have to, we have to let ourselves feel that. So yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Oh, I wanted to, I wanted to read this uh, part from 26. It says, this is the bridge again, really good bridges. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Reality will break your heart. Survival will not be the hardest part. It's keeping all your hopes alive when all the rest of you has died. So let it break your heart. Mm -hmm. Can you read that again? <laughs> yeah. So reality will break your heart. Survival will not be the hardest part. It's keeping all your hopes alive when all the rest of you has died. So let it break your heart. Yeah. I feel like you, you could do like Lexio Divino with these, uh, <laughs> <laughs> meditate on these lyrics. It's definitely like, definitely showing her emo roots. Yeah. <laughs> could be right out of the soul. It's the melancholics Lexio. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. So this idea of hope. So I think in like just in, in a worldly sense, hope is just kind of like an optimism of like, things will get better, you know, and I'm, I'm looking up and I'm going to, you know, just keep on trucking. And I love what you said, Emma, about how, when you hit rock bottom, it's this recognition that like, I can't keep going. And it kind of forces you in some ways to, to turn to God because you can't, you really can't force yourself to hope, right? At some point you can't anymore. And, um, hope in the, the Christian understanding and the Catholic understanding is one of what they call the theological virtues. And uh, Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas, they, they differentiate between what are called like the natural virtues, which are things that just God has given us the ability to develop. So it's like being prudent and like, you know, being, uh, being like just and fair and that sort of thing. But then there are theological virtues, which re like require the, the extra grace of God in your life. And those are faith, hope, and love. Uh, the greatest of, of course is love. But you can't have real hope. You can have courage. You can have fortitude. You can have perseverance in your natural abilities. But to have real hope, to look at even the worst of the world, to look at the cross, to look at all the awful things that happen and still have hope, that requires somewhere within you the grace of God. Even if, even if you don't call it God, even if you don't call it Jesus, even if you're not a professed Christian, to really have real hope in the midst of those circumstances, mm -hmm. you, you need the grace of God. And if you know, maybe, uh, listeners, if you're one of those people, if you're one of those people that feels like even in the deepest, darkest night, there's that little spark up there. I just want to suggest that, you know, well, I believe, and you know, maybe this is worth considering that, that, re that means if that hope is real then that means that God is real because mm -hmm. only God can only overcome that darkness. Mm -hmm. So, um, and also, uh, hope takes worth it work there. Cause there's a song, uh, careful, uh, off of brand new eyes where it says, you can't be too careful anymore when all that is waiting for you won't come any closer. You've got to reach out. Um, so sometimes mm -hmm. you got to reach out. You can't just wait for, you know, so especially if you're going through those hard times, reach out, find somebody, you know, maybe a, a counselor, older, you know, mentor, family member, somebody just walk into a church and talk to a priest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if that's the work, you know, just sometimes you got to reach out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Love that. I want to talk about uh, another big theme on After Laughter is feeling is uh, forgiveness. Forgiveness. 
<laughs> is that oh what what song was that that's uh oh i think <laughs> i think it was that 80s song that <laughs> yeah don even hanley if, even if, even if, yeah. yeah like one of the best breakup songs anymore. of all time yes i was yeah that's, that's a paramore great song. song but that's what came out <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh yeah the parrot yeah well i love that song too but <laughs> It's, uh, I don't know what key it's in. Let's see if I can figure it out. Um, you, you want forgiveness. Oh, that's it. <laughs> but I, I can't give it yet. Right? Yeah, um, that's a great song. I love the... So good. I love the rhythm of it. Yeah, I love the, the uh, vocal melody and rhythm. Again, super happy yeah. <laughs> sounding. Yeah. It's like very like floaty and dreamy. Mm-hmm. It's it's cool that she has that song and she's like, I can't give it to you. And then there's grudges where she's like, Well, we can't keep holding on to grudges. <laughs> yeah. Oh right, because and that even happens like later on the album. Right. Right? Grudges is is after that. I love that when artists do that, you can like follow yeah. as you listen to the whole album. Yeah. Yeah. It's why we need to go back to CDs and records. Forget this streaming stuff. Yes. Amen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh in you you want forgiveness, but I can barely hang on to myself. Uh, I'm afraid that I'll have nothing left. Mm. Don't you go and get it twisted. Forgiving is not forgetting. Again, another really good bridge. All right, so let's let's talk about forgiveness because this is a hard one because there are real hurts in the world, right? And even in our church, there's real awful hurts, things people have done to other people, and I've I've you know witnessed witnessed that firsthand. Um, how do you how do you forgive? I don't know. It's it. it I I do dislike that phrase like um forgive and forget you know like uh, I, I don't think that that's i don't think that it's healthy you know uh, because i think mercy even god's mercy is is a bit of a process you know it's it's god's salvation soaking into the depth of who we are you know and god's mercy is ultimately directed toward um you know, complete redemption, like full redemption. And that, and that kind of redemption requires effort on our part, you know, God's grace pouring into our lives and, and bringing us out of the depths of hurt and death and sin and brokenness, you know, and I think it's the same thing with between people, you know, I think um, mercy is a process. And I think uh, it takes time. It, I think it takes that, I think that it takes that in, initial willingness and I think, I think in the spiritual life, it would be, yeah, you go to confession, you know, um, and you receive, you know, the grace sufficient for eternal life. But then you work through it. You work through, well, what was the woundedness in my life that, that made me feel like I needed that sin rather than God? You know, what's the, yeah. what's the deprivation in my life that needs to be filled up? What, what human faculty is, is broken and not functioning fully as made in God's image? Mm -hmm. And I think uh, I think it's the same thing with people, and yeah, I think um, yeah, the willingness to forgive is one thing, and then the the willingness to go through the process of redemption is another thing, and then the willingness to put up with the free will of other people who don't want to forgive you and don't want to go through that process with you is another thing. <laughs> or maybe aren't even sorry. Yeah, they're not. Yeah. Yeah. Not even mm -hmm. sorry. And it sounds like, um, I don't know. I like that. This song is kind of like, uh, she's just being very blunt about where she's at, you know? And it sounds like, like to me, there's something, there's something really redemptive about admitting that I'm not yeah. ready mm -hmm. to forgive you yet. Because it admits yeah. that, like, I'd like to, but I just can't handle that right now. I'm, and and I, I don't even think that it would even, you know, she might be saying, like, I, I can't forgive you, you know. But it, it, it probably more what she means is I, I don't trust you. I'm so hurt yeah. that I have to keep my distance and I can't let go which of is it fine. yet. Yeah, yeah, which is good and healthy in some ways. And. I think um, I think engaging with that and being really honest with oneself um, is yeah one of the one of the first steps to you know actually getting to that forgiveness and yeah. redemption of the relationship or whatever. Mm -hmm.
I once heard someone put it this way that there's like forgiveness, which is, which is, well, so there's closure and that's when you're like om- emotionally you've dealt with like what has happened and you've like reached a good place with it, like that inner peace. Uh, but that's not forgiveness. That's closure. Right. And then there's reconciliation, which is when the two people repair the relationship and are able to continue in some sort of relationship, but that's not forgiveness either. That's reconciliation. Forgiveness is just you choosing to say, you know, with your mind, not with your heart, you're saying, I'm going to forgive them. And it sounds like she's there. And like when the church asks us to forgive people, it's not saying force your heart to have closure because that comes with time. It's not saying yeah. reconcile with this toxic, hurtful person who's yeah. going to hurt you again because you, sometimes you do need that distance. Sometimes you do need good boundaries. So I think a lot of times people use forgiveness to mean all of those things when it really just means one of them. Right. So, all right, we got to bring this in for a landing because I, uh, we're, we're running out of time here. So I want to close in prayer, but first I just want to thank you guys so much for taking your time. I know it's, it's early in the morning where you are, it's in the evening where we are. So just thank you for all you're doing to, uh, so support the, the church and support the arts. Um, if you want to find out about your, uh, projects, where should they go to find you? Uh, yeah, we've got a website. It's called enemy And we would, uh, we've got a Facebook page, also enemy love records. We've got an Instagram um, but we, we're really like, uh, one of the things we're, we're a big proponent of is just having a positive effect on the music industry as we get more and more into it. And so we really encourage people to, to buy, not only if, if you're going to support us, if you, if you're interested in our music, um, obviously get it wherever, you know, works for you, but it's, it's preferable to purchase and, and support the artist directly. And I would say that for any, yeah. any artist, like don't buy from Amazon, don't buy from, <laughs> you know, the huge companies that don't need any more money, go straight to the artist because it's hard, you know, it's hard to spend 20 years learning how to play an instrument and then three years making an album. And then you, and you're trying to sell a CD for 10 bucks. You know what I mean? No yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nobody wants to pay it cause they can yeah. get it for eight bucks a month on Spotify. So it's yep. if you want good music, um, it's it's worth voting with your dollar in that way by supporting the artist directly. All right, well let's let's close in prayer. Would you, one of you guys uh, be willing to close us? Sure. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Jesus, we love you so much. Thank you for loving us, for dying for us, for always forgiving us over and over. We thank you for the gift of music. Um, we pray that we may use it to bless others and may it lead others to you. We pray for uh, Haley, Taylor, and Zach, just that they would come to know you in a deeper way, Lord, um, that they would experience transformation and conversion of heart. Um, we just pray for musicians everywhere, um, everyone who's listening to this podcast, um, just that you would be with them right now in this very moment, Lord, and just yeah, breathe your love upon them. We just pray all this through the intercession of Mary. Amen. 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 Father, Father, Son, Son. Awesome. Amen. Thank you very much, Emma and David. Check out Enemy Love Records, um, all the places online. Thank you so much, listeners, for uh, tra- traipsing down uh, the discography <laughs> of Paramore. Uh, again, they're one of my favorite bands. So we're allowed to do more than one episode on them. If you want to support this show and everything that we're doing, you can go to popculturecatechism.com and become one of the patrons. By being a patron of this show, you get access to exclusive content. Every episode has exclusive content, but also all my talks that I give in my speaking ministry are in there as well. I want to thank all our patrons, but especially Carl and Melissa Gore and Lisa and Bob Tenney, Steve and Maggie Hubbard, and Tom and Emily Camberiotti and all of our patrons. And uh, you get access to all that exclusive content through the Awaken app. The Awaken app is free for everyone. And then if you're a patron, you have one of the shows on Awaken Catholic, you get uh, exclusive content as well. But if you're one of the free members, you also get access to uh, the Christian Music Library, Christian Prayer Library, which is trilingual in English, Spanish, and Latin. And lots. it's also just a, a great hub to see all the Awaken shows and also a great Christian community as well. So definitely check that out. You can tell us in the comments your favorite Paramore songs or things that we commented on that we, we did or things you want to comment on that we didn't get to. So please let us know. And thank you listeners so much. Uh, and we will see you next time. God bless. <laughs>
my glasses off It got me nervous Right at the end of my rope A half empty girl Don't make me laugh I'll choke Just let me cry Just 